have these private groups that are run and created by the elite, uh, by the ultra-rich, wealthy families that have been manipulating global markets from behind the scenes for generations. They create these private groups that then feed information to the government, to senators, to congressmen, their recommendations, their policy papers, what they think should happen. And it's fascinating because if you actually read what it is that they're doing, uh, the recommendations that they make, they're very able to get them put in place. Discussions that are going on in these private groups are really talks that should be going on in Senate committees and in the halls of Congress, but they're happening with these ultra-elite groups that are then pushing their propaganda into the political mainstream, and then it's becoming enacted, it's becoming put into law. Still not convinced the CFR is promoting a new world order? Listen to what Leslie Gelb had to say upon leaving the New York Times to chair the organization as its president in 1993. Uh, I loved it. Doing a column is a great job. I'm going to an equally great but different job, and in a, in a way a job that, that caps everything I've been doing in my life, in government, in academia, and in journalism. Uh, I think that's what the, the Council on Foreign Relations will allow me to do. Well, you know, for example, uh, you had me and uh, three or four other folks on this show a few months ago Karen to Alice talk about or, the New World Order, right? right? Exactly. Right? Bob I talk about new, it, exactly. Right. I talk about it all the time. New World Order wants a global system where one small central authority of individuals can then dictate a policy that's going to be distributed down to the rest of the world, everywhere, in the smallest little town in the middle of nowhere in, in some remote country. I now think it's safe to say that the Council is extremely influential on the world stage and openly promote global governance. The Council and the globalists were able to take this agenda to the next level following World War II. The United Nations was born out of the ashes of this conflict. Unlike the League of Nations, the United States not only joined this organization, they championed it. The first book I wrote was uh, The Fearful Master, a second look at the United Nations. It was written at a time when it was not popular to be critical of the UN. I mean, the United Nations was viewed by almost everybody as our last best hope for peace. It was a means, we were told, to bring humanity together and put an end to war and live in peace and harmony and promote trade and all of these good things. I wish it were any of those things, but it's not. The original charter for the United Nations was drafted in San Francisco in 1945 and the United States became a permanent member of the Security Council, along with France, the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, and the Republic of China. The process by which other nations' belief systems could be used to erode and eviscerate our Constitution and Bill of Rights had taken a giant leap forward. The United Nations is one of the most well-known sort of globalization attempts. Its primary goal is to streamline all the governments of the world, to create a global council, and to unify all the rules and all the regulations for the world. So it's essentially the precursor uh, and an engine of this new world order. The United Nations is made up of all of the countries of the world, most of which are dictatorships of one kind or another. And you don't take a bunch of dictatorships and put them into a bag and shake it up and come out with a a freedom-loving uh, governmental unit. You come out with a global dictatorship. This was the public base of global governance. However, many other organizations have been birthed since. Even more suspect is a private group called the Trilateral Commission. David Rockefeller and Henry Kissinger are among its some 300 influential members. The Trilateral Commission, rich in powerful business and political leaders from Japan, Europe, and North America, the New York-based policy group was formed in 1973 by Chase Manhattan Bank Chairman David Rockefeller. In addition to Rockefeller, there are many other noted American members. Among them, economist Alan Greenspan, former Defense Secretary Harold Brown. George Bush was once a member, but resigned last year before his unsuccessful presidential campaign. Back then, it wasn't politically wise to be aligned with what his party's right wing considered a shadow world government. The United Nations would take over America. The Trilateral Commission would control the world. Just look at its membership, they say. Current and former members include Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Carter. 
names like Brzezinski, Christopher, Kissinger, and Schultz, and top executives of ITT, Xerox, Exxon, and Nations Bank. Although this group with only 300 members seems to be at the apex of the power structure, there is yet another group formed in 1954 that is even smaller in number and has a greater influence on world events. Meet the Bilderberg Group. This elite group meet annually around the globe. There is a core group of members who have attended every year for decades, such as David Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger, and Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands. These members invite others who are politically and socially relevant at the time. Each year, around 140 people are in attendance. I happened to be in Europe then on my way to Russia. I was invited to go to Bilderberg by Vernon Jordan, a friend of mine and a genuine hero of the civil rights movement. And to the best of my knowledge, NAFTA was not discussed by anybody in my presence. Documents released by the group in 2001 reveal that in September of 1955, the group met in Germany and covertly outlined the idea of a European Union. Section E, European Unity, discusses the general support for European integration and unification, and the idea to unify Germany once again with the rest of Europe under a common marketplace. Belgian Viscount and current Bilderberg Chairman Etienne Davignon told the EU Observer in 2009 that the next Bilderberg meeting could improve understanding on future action in the same way it helped create the Euro in the 1990s. This illustrates the patience, vision, and reach of this organization. It was able to promote and establish both the European Union and the European currency over the course of just under 40 years, incrementally. One of the things that the um, elitists discussed back at the turn of the century when they were talking about how do you convert the United States into a collectivist system was the fact that you can't do it quickly. You have to let people get used to it incrementally because any major change would be rejected. The 1957 Conference of Rome, where the Common Market Treaty, providing for free trade in all products, was at last signed. Six nations, France, Germany, Italy, Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg, agreed to remove all mutual barriers to trade within 12 to 15 years, the embryo of a political union which they proclaimed to be their ultimate objective. In that fashion, it's possible for people to get used to this process and even to think it's a good thing. People will accept uh, the gradual uh, growth of government, the gradual loss of their purchasing power. Uh, they'll accept almost anything if it's done gradually. And we have to be very alert to that. 2008 and 2009 attendees include World Bank President Robert Zolik, Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner, former head of British Secret Intelligence Richard Dearlove, Donald Graham, CEO of the Washington Post, CNN host and author of The Post-American World, Fareed Zakaria, and many other giants of business, politics, and media. You just came back from meeting with the Bilderberg Group. The Bilderberg Group are, you know, I, when, when people who are conspiracy theory, theory people, I, they send me mail, it's usually about the Bilderberg Group. And I get these books in my front door, which I'm uncomfortable with, but, and it's all about the Bilderberg like they're the modern day Illuminati. Are you a member of the Bilderberg Group? Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't think we're supposed to talk about this. Many have identified them as the kingmakers, the puppet masters that pull the strings behind the scenes. Perhaps there is no better example of this than what occurred during the 2008 conference. Immediately after Obama had been selected as the Democratic presidential nominee, the pressure was on to choose a running mate. We've put together a committee. We are going to uh, be equally deliberative in how we move forward. And we're not going to do it in the press, or we're not going to do it through surrogates. He then tricked the press corps into staying on the plane as it took off from Washington. He was whisked away to an undisclosed location. 
What's interesting and dangerous about the New World Order is that it's not a natural progressing idea. It's just not civilization naturally evolving and organizing into this system. It's the group of extremely powerful people that are manipulating the system to get it to this status from behind the scenes without anybody's knowledge. You have to ask yourself if there isn't an agenda going on to keep those organizations quiet and to keep them out of the news, to keep the discussions about them behind closed doors, then why is it that these supposed experts on the left and on the right never talk about them? This has been a condensed history of the globalist organizations and their rise to power. But is there a reason they meet behind closed doors? A shadow world government has been mentioned, but to truly understand what that means, let's go back to this iconic warning from President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Progress toward these noble goals is persistently threatened by the conflict now engulfing the world. It commands our whole attention, absorbs our very beings. We face a hostile ideology, global in scope, atheistic in character, ruthless in purpose and insidious in method. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Through multinational corporations, global intelligence networks, out-of-control banksters, all under the veil of national security and black operations, the global elite have consolidated power on a massive scale over the last several decades. You see, Global corporations not only fund and develop large technological and military projects here and abroad, they also own the consumer industry and production, as well as all of the important media. By owning the vast majority of what we hear and see on a daily basis, we have been manipulated on a mass scale as to regards to what we believe and desire, both socially and politically. Edward Bernays, the nephew of world-famous psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, would study group dynamics and become the father of public relations. He authored the book Propaganda in 1928. In it, he described how to intelligently and consciously manipulate the habits and opinions of the masses within a democratic society. He went on to state that those who harness this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government and are the true ruling power. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind, who harness old social forces and contrive new ways to bind and guide the world. The average American is distracted, mindless, worried about minuscule things, celebrities, as if it was their own family members. And this is by design, because the powers that be, who own the media, know how our brains work. They know scientifically how the human mind functions. They know about sociology, and they are using the media and have used the media for decades now to entertain people with issues that don't really matter. When you have the big news networks covering celebrity issues as if it's the most important thing, it becomes the most important thing. And this is not by accident. This is to keep us out of the way. Because if you're worried about the latest celebrity death or the latest celebrity couple or the celebrity breakup or your, your sports team um, having a shot at the Super Bowl or the World Series. There's so much information about those issues that can be discussed that will mesmerize people and they won't know or care about the real issues that are out there. Well, I think this is just one more piece of evidence of the degree to which the media, supposedly the watchdogs, uh, has become the gatekeeper of the system. So as the populace is mesmerized and hypnotized by powerful behind the scenes forces, as they are distracted by the latest celebrity scandal, the newest cell phone, and their favorite sports team, this network disguises itself, remaining in the shadows. <laughs>